I know the version of mask with cat man dude. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. Welcome to One Fucking Hour. Uh, I'm Evan Husney, and uh, we got Tom Fitzgerald over here. Well, hello there. <laughs> uh, and to my right, uh, Marcus Herring. What's up, man? Hey, guys. Man, I'm really stoked about the film this week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Easy, uh, easy now. Easy, easy. <laughs> yeah, we should mention uh, a big time swerve on uh, this week's episode. Um, last uh, At the end of last week's episode, which was on uh, Bob Fuasi's uh Star 80, we, uh, there was a little debate as to what the next uh, film should be. Uh, I kind of jokingly threw out Mask, but I guess it kind of stuck. <laughs> and uh, we were but I took do, it seriously. You took it very seriously. <laughs> I did. We were, we were going to do uh, Welcome to the Dollhouse, which was a Marcus pick, but we are pro- uh, postponing that uh, so a guest can join us. Isn't that right next week? Yeah, next week we'll be doing Welcome to the Dollhouse as previously scheduled. Um, but this is it, guys. One hour on mask. Somebody shot me. <laughs> not that mask. Yeah. <laughs> no, no oh, mask not, from really? Oh, no, I thought no, we were not, doing oh, mask oh. from 1995, oh, right? No, no, you guys said mind. mask 95. Wait, did I watch the wrong yeah. mask? Oh, oh no, I don't want to do the other mask. <laughs> okay, look, we're gonna have to audible <laughs> on this mask. Okay. So, yeah. all right. You know what? I right. can wing it. I'll Guys? do the 85 mask. I'll, let's do it. Really? Okay. I'll wing it. Let's do it. All right. Somebody stop 80? me. Somebody All stop right. me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, let's. It's time to mask up. Let's get ready here. Oh, and, uh, no. <laughs> I'm an anti-masker. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. This, this does not bode well for the rest it of this hour. does not. Um, All right, everybody. Ma- Mask this? mandate. Unmask. Unmasked. Mask. Okay. Unmasked. All right. Time out. <laughs> it's time to start the clock. Okay. This fucking hour is on the 1985 Peter Peter B. Uh, Peter Bogdanovich's mask. All right. I'm starting the goddamn countdown. Oh, here we go. Tick now. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> now it's really time to see if Tom's going to dig his own grave tonight by insisting that we go forth in this movie. But all right. Let's, yeah, this, this, is, this is all. You could have vetoed this, guys. But go ahead. The Tom's top picks at uh, cracking up and mask. <laughs> I have excellent. I have excellent taste, obviously. Um, all right. So, mask. Okay, here we go. Time's burning. Time's All right, burning. come on, come on, come on. Please, let's eat some more, burn some more time off the clock, then let's start. All right, calm down. Let's laugh it out. Let's laugh it out. We're doing mask. We're doing mask. All right. Let's laugh it out. Okay, okay I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Breathe. Breathe. Mm. All right, mask is the true story of Rocky Dennis, a Los Angeles teenager played by Eric Stoltz, who was born with a the rare condition called uh, I'm going to try it here craniodiffusial dysplasia, uh, a bone disorder similar to what you know John Merrick suffered in The Elephant Man, and mm-hmm. the film follows his attempts to lead a normal life, uh, as normal of a life as possible, with his biker gang mom, uh, played by Cher. Uh, kind of sounds like a sitcom, uh, but it is directed by. Uh, it is directed by a very neckerchiefed uh, Peter Bogdanovich, or as he's known in this house, Peter B. So, Peter uh, B, baby, baby. <laughs> B. That's our affectionate nickname for uh, Mr. Bogdanovich. Yes. What's up, B? Peter B. Peter B. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Tom, uh, mm-hmm. since this, you know, since you did, you know, force us into this uh, this week, please give, oh. us a, give us a give us a <laughs> little that. rundown on your. Uh, just give us a little rundown on Mask for You uh, and where you No, I, I got you. Um, okay, so why are we doing this? Now, um, partly, uh, it is it is a film I've seen many, many times, which Same. just, but yeah, okay, which just, um, there, there, that means something. Like, why didn't I just keep flipping the channel, mm. you know, like, like and, and do it fast? Like, whoa, chairs in a, you know, in the living room yelling, like, I'm out of here. Like, no, but I go stop watch and that's how i know it cable because my god it played cable 
since it came out, you know, on cable and t- t- today. It's probably on right now. So, you know. <laughs> great, great, great TBS uh, 101, you know. Totally. So, so I'm one of those people. I just would see it. And, and I, don't know, I don't know why. I've never thought about Mask in any particular way <laughs> until, you know, we just committed to doing the title now. But, um, but, I, but then I look back and I go, I really know it very, very well. I almost didn't ha- need to have to rewatch it, you know. So um, the conclusion I had by rewatching it again recently is, okay, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just fucking mask, okay? <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that is it has its deficiencies it has its pr- and, and its, its pluses, pros and cons, like a lot of films. And we've played or we've discussed like films that are flawed, like, uh, like Zardoz, you know, is a recent example, like uh, it's kind of wobbly. Now, I don't think weirdly that mask is wobbly. I think it is 100%. What makes it bad is 100% and intentional. And what makes it good actually is 100% and intentional. Hmm. And um, so I don't know if I use the word f- I'm fascinated by mask, but I, it's very watchable for me, you know. And I think one of the things is it's very watchable the same way like you're flipping the radio and um, some really dumb pop song like, you know, like, uh, you know, um, never going to give you up, you know, like something like that. <laughs> or like um, or like, you know, like uh, wake me up before you go, go like yeah. it's just um I don't know if I'd recommend it or I even like that Wham song, but it's just like on and it's like, oh, it's like, yeah. And like, like, you know, like, <laughs> leave me going solo. You know, it's just like, I know it and it's there and it's strong as a pure pop camp confection. Okay. Right. So, so that's how I feel about Mask. So it's like beyond like a serious criticism. I think part of the reason for me, it's beyond serious criticism is that I don't, I realize just rewatching it now that this is a YA film and it's made for a YA, you know, young adult audience. Yeah. PG 13. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's like for, it's just, it's like, I think the target is like a 13 year old girl who goes horseback riding on the, on Sundays, you know, it's like, it's, it's that. And that's part of how that love story is in there, you know, mm-hmm. cause it really is just like the identification is probably the Lord during the blind girl, you know, just not right. to get ahead of ourselves, but I'm just saying that and that's probably how you uh, sold it too, right? He's probably just went into the pitch meeting and said, elephant man for, no, this, elephant, this, or whatever. I don't know the backstory of someone. I'm right. saying elephant man for teens was someone right. said that somewhere in the absolutely process. like the producers. Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. this was a, this was a gig for Bogdanovich. He just got hired, but that but makes I know what you a lot of sense actually. That yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so I'm just wrapping up kind of like my, my overarching impression. So, um, uh, but it works kind of like how like the outsiders works like is the outsiders a good film i think it's better than mass but i'm just saying yeah. like it's not but it's not over the edge which is an awesome well-made right. killer film you know so it's just it's just pop confection it's like uh like uh, I, I watch saint elmo's fire you know i'm that guy you know what i mean so like and i love <laughs> 80s i, I, I love, love it too <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love 80s camp. And not even I didn't see it back then. I was going to see Sonic Youth and shit then. Like, I'm saying that it's not mm-hmm. so it's not like personal nostalgia. Like, oh, I watched this first time in a drive in. I was just like, uh, I watched it in the like, past few years. And I'm like, wow, this is total shit, you know, and it just hits. And because it, it hits all those um, c- cynically, it hits all the marks. And so there's something nice and comfy I like about that. And that's what mask is. But I could I'll elaborate later that I think mask has a unique element which is there is a hardcore disturbing nightmare um, head that is the, the, the lead thing, the iconic imagery of this film that is otherwise, you know, a cotton candy pop confection, which I think has some strange friction and tension. We can get into that in a minute, but that's basically yeah. what I'm saying. No, 100%. Let me uh, throw it to Marcus. Marcus, uh, any mask memories or feelings on mask in general before we get I mean, into it? I mean, it's not my, I mean, it's, it's a lot like well, you Tom. said you've seen it a lot, right? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, okay. yeah, it's like, it was on, I, I, I was a kid when it came out. So I was probably like six. So like I have, it was really hard for me to unsee it to like when it, when it was brought up like in a critical light, you know, or like that there might be like bad parts or something. I was kind of like, what? Because like it, I saw it when I was a kid, and there's stuff that maybe you know, uh, maybe people were goofing on like about like the colors or something. And I was like, 
But I saw that as a kid. I was like, that's brilliant. When <laughs> she's showing him, the, teaching the, the blind girl what the colors are by the handing her the blue stone or like the cold stone. Red stone. blue. So I was like we'll six years old. old. We'll watch right. that. But I was like six years old going like, that's brilliant. You know, this Rocky guy <laughs> is really smart. So it was hard for me to, and even, and even this time, I think like, like you said, it was on TV all the time. Oh my and god! And like, like relentlessly. That's and I like, thought. I almost didn't have to watch it too. Like every one of these movies, I'm kind of nervous. Like, oh, I need to rewatch that one, even though I was like, I basically knew I'd have next to nothing to talk about on Mask. I was, I was like, I don't think I have to rewatch it because yeah. like, I, know I know it. it. So well. yeah, I got exactly. it. Like, 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 um, like, what is it? Like, uh, what something in verse? You know, like, uh, what is that Bible term? Like I got it to something in verse. Who cares? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, something. Chapter and verse. Yeah, um, even the devil can quote the Bible to serve his purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but so, but um, yeah, I think uh, it's uh, yeah. No, I there's a lot of weird things too. With like for me, um, my mom dressed like Cher. Like she wore like leather oh, s- skirts and stuff. Cool. She had kind of big hair like that. And my mom's name is Cher. So there's like a lot of weird what? stuff. Like I, you Your know, mom's Cher. Like, and you haven't told us still to Are you masked? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. My mom doesn't have a last name. So it's really Your weird. Mom but, uh, Cher. Okay. No, but my mom is Yeah, my mom is Cher. So uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of just weird things mixed up in it for me. And Right, right. Um, yeah, wow. anyway. And then just the fact that Rocky, you know, I like a lot of people. I was interested in people like Rocky, you know, and I reading about them and stuff. So I definitely did some digging in his life, like, you know, years yeah. back and just like, mm-hmm. and I was always just struck that he was, that he was a real person and that he, you know, that he died as a teenager and that the, you know, the, the bullet points of this story are real, that he was like, uh, his mom was a biker and all this stuff. And I watched her interview on like, oh, I, don't yeah. know, I was like, not, you know, some TV oh, she's show. She's amazing. Remember. Oh, I watched it too. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. craniodophysial dysplasia. Like, she's got it right off Get the that over here. Song, she's know? like yeah. thick. He sounds like one. Joey Ramone, kind of. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, like. She's awesome. Rusty. Yeah, she's little awesome. Rusty. Rusty. Oh, she's Rusty. very cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just broadly, like, yeah, it's just, it's so baked into the cake. And it's when Thomas Hockey got me really thinking about how the 80s did really seem to kind of perfect that confectionary thing you're talking about. Like, the movies in the seventies still had like artistic pretense or they were kind of gritty and yeah. raw, you know, but in the eighties, like they just really, you know, everything was marketed at kids and teens and, you know, all the commercials and toys and all, you know, cartoons, Saturday morning, everything True. was just aimed at like yeah. getting kids attention. It seems like they really just figured out the perfect way to bake that cake to make kids kind of just to suck their attention. You know, like I was raised by the TV and uh, yeah. so I guess mask in some ways helped, you know, raise me. But uh, well, they yeah, got you. Like- That's the thing. Like you're, you were the demo more or less in that age group ish. And like, you know, bingo at all. They, they, they you know, ticked all the boxes. And uh, you're right. It's just like I think it is a perfecting of um, of, uh, you know, giving the public what they want. And for them, the public is, you know, like under 18. And uh, that was a revelation for me because I always just kind of assumed that this film was made for adults. Or at least it, you know, crossed over and went into the, you know, the demo would be like, you know, 16 to like 32 or something. But it's just really not. And that actually makes you, or I give the film more of a break when I realize that it is yeah. just a YA film. I think Bogdanovich threw me off for a moment. Well, we'll that get I to that. Be more, yeah, no, no, but I'm just saying like, like, like I kind of thought there was a more sophisticated uh, um, intent and yeah. that it failed. Yeah. But I think it actually is a successful YA film. Right. You know? right, right. Yeah, that makes well, total sense. I mean, maybe he was even going for like kind of an outsider scene now that you mention it, right? Like maybe. To be like, well, with the bikers. To, that's YA, too. I think, you know? he, I think like he needed a, a hit. It's like soft well, teddy bear, you know, tough guy YA film, you know? Totally. So, well, yeah. before we get into the movie, you know, just I, I, I think it's good to remind the people that this episode <clears throat> is actually our first sequel or loose sequel uh, to <laughs> a one fucking hour episode. Um, so for those who, uh, maybe didn't listen last week was our one fucking hour on Bob Fosse's star 80. Um, and for those that didn't listen, uh, that is the true story. Uh, that movie is based on the true story of the grisly murder of playboy, playmate, play, playboy, playmate, Dorothy Stratton, who was killed by her husband, Paul Snyder. And in the months leading to her murder, Dorothy was having an affair with the director of tonight's film, Peter B, uh, which of course definitely mm. added to the fuel uh, that was uh, already the burning inferno that was uh, Snyder's jealous rage and you might not think that there is a concrete link between 
an underrated gem like Star 80 and fucking Mask, but there is. Um, and some might even say if it isn't for Dorothy's unfortunate death and a string of Hollywood flops by Mr. Peter B., that we might not mm-hmm. actually have had the chance or the pleasure to experience Mask. But I want to uh, put your attention here to The Killing of the Unicorn by Peter Bogdanovich, mm-hmm. the book that you know Ramey brought on last week. And uh, she found this section for us to read here tonight because I think this is what tees up Mask in a lot of ways. Or at least... It doesn't it, mention Mask, does it? No, but it, it doesn't... Well, this is before... I, th- I think this is probably before Mask, but it does kind of, I think... Um, uh, it becomes the excuse for why he makes mask, you know, at least publicly. <laughs> um, so I just want to read this. So of course he's. This is about you know th- this whole book here is a long, basically book long obituary he wrote for Dorothy Stratton about their relationship and her life. And uh, this section here says, um, the first professional stage production Dorothy ever saw was the Broadway version of The Elephant Man, a drama about the 19th century freak. Okay, thanks, Peter. <laughs> That's you're quoting Peter right there, uh, yeah, yeah. right? Because he wrote this yeah. book. Okay, sure. Thanks, quoting. thanks, Peter. Nineteenth <laughs> century freak John Merrick. Uh, she went wow. alone. She went alone to the uh, to a matinee one afternoon while I was working. She had been fascinated by the story. A few days later, near midnight in D- uh, Double Days, a bookstore, she picked up a factual study of Merrick and began leafing through it avidly. She didn't blanch at the naked photographs of Merrick's grotesquely shaped body. Five paces away, my eye couldn't stay on the pages she was studying so closely. Dorothy bought the book and read it with keen interest. One month after her death, I would see the play. I realized the reason Dorothy had felt such empathy with Elephant Man John Merrick, her outward appearance, like his, (laughs) concealed and distracted from her true identity. His grotesque form masked a pure and loving spirit. For most people, it was equally impossible to see beyond the dazzle of Dorothy's beauty. So guys... She's comparing, she's saying, he's saying that she's so pretty that somehow she was like disabled or something. <laughs> well, I actually kind of understand. He, he's, he's kind of all thumbs in his, uh, what he wrote there. But I think you could, a, a more eloquent person could say pretty succinctly that when you have a striking physical appearance, yes. it's on the spectrum between, you know, what's called the grotesque and then what's called, you know, like stunning beauty is that they both are just like, uh, re- it's a real hurdle for whoever carries that image. Sure. People because, are staring at you, right? Yeah, well, there's all kinds of things. Like, people have weird intentions. You know, it's not like us, us three mugs who just have, like, faces. You know what I mean? Like, 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 and, we, and people, like, say, hi, how you doing? And they meet us, and it's like, oh, you're a person with a dumb face. Who cares? You know, but, like, those two <laughs> have, like, things that are, like, it's a major factor in their interactions, in their socialization. So I, I can see, I can, uh, fuck Peter B's, description but i could see her making that correlation internally uh because she she carried that you know weight with her you know like she can't just like go down the street you know and and not just be this incredibly hot woman in the eyes of all these dumb men and all that stuff so um i kind of get that i kind of empathize with her even a little bit more uh dorothy um in in how she took to yeah merrick's story you know that's interesting it's very interesting um but uh, but yeah. So what you know? So, so, so he would yeah, later kind of say he would later kind of say that mask would would be a tribute to her, or at least that's how I think he's rationalizing why wow. he did this direct you know director for hire gig on this film, uh, which yeah. is um, you know whatever. But anyway, um, let's get into it, wow. man. Mask. Uh, I don't even know where to start. But what are your me. thoughts, uh, Mr. Evan? Well. To be quite honest, I mean, I totally see what you're saying. I was watching it, and maybe I wasn't seeing it through the YA lens as much as you were. But to me, it was a gimmick. Film. I only just did like this this like yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah when yeah. I okay. watched. It. I find it to be, you know, a pretty blatant gimmick film. I I I do think it's kind of lifeless, you know, for most of it. Um, and and it's like it's not really even that dramatic, you know. There isn't a lot of things that are really happening. I know. In this movie. It's very yeah. weird how we're just like in some cases maybe that's in a with like in in a better director's hands, just kind of hanging out with mask might be a cool movie. But in this right. sense, the scenes are very flat and kind of just vapid. But and um, they're supposed but, to play more dramatically than they do, and they just right. sit there so often. I know. Yeah, it is. It is weird, Marcus. 
Yeah, I think maybe a lot of the the drama is sort of um, curtailed by the the audience, you know, like because it deals with these heavy subject matters. Like the mom is like a drug addict, but she's like, you know, she's still like her hair's her makeup's perfect, and she's like looks amazing, and her right. life's like she can pay her rent, and you know, I, I guess the real woman was a drug addict too, but like, you know, Rocky's like they 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 allude to it a little bit, like that the mom's got she's like really hard on the edges. She treats people like shit. And then Rocky's like really nice to everybody. He's like, see you later, you know? And he's kind of like, I felt like he was almost like, uh, like, you know, like Al Anon guy, kind of like having to cover up for his mom. Who's like just this alcoholic mm. mess. And then he's having to be like extra nice and kind of like patch the holes after she's been really rude to somebody like the principal or like whatever. almost enabling, like, you know, like clean up after the, yeah, kind of cleaning up after her mess, you know? And, um, and that's yeah, sort of their dynamic, of which could have been like a really dramatic story. And you could see someone actually make it today and like, and, and really know. tap into that, those elements to make it really dramatic. But I think that the fact that you're saying it was a work for hire and then that they wanted it for a teen audience, it seems like that they really kind of, um, soft like rounded the edges of everything of like oh can, can i actually raise uh an off-mentioned hilarious example of the rounding the edges and i call it the g the g-rated biker gang it was a very <laughs> short scene but uh just roll that beautiful bean footage you know all right let's take a look here we go G-rated. So this biker is the gang. badass biker gang oh golly <laughs> Puppies! <laughs> hey, is that a like bunch puppies? of puppies? Is that a bunch of puppies? Look at those puppies! Look at that! It looks like a fairy tale or something. You know, like, it, uh, why is it so like smoky? It is. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I was gonna say well, that, too is well, like. There you go. And there's a lot more where that came well, from. Yeah, I was gonna of, say because there's of this G-rated uh, biker gang. Yeah, I mean, there's scenes where you see this fucking biker gang like riding carnival rides and shit, you know, and it's just like that's, that's what some, you only see. That's <laughs> like, right, but that's some fucking Peter B. shit right there because you know, like it is because because Peter B. has never been in the company of rustic people like that. Like, there's no, <laughs> no, not even yeah, much less bikers, but any kind of people in the lower rung of uh, yeah. society are absolutely right. Yeah, so like yeah, he's you know. he's totally clueless about. Um, working class life, you know, Rusty, Rusty's more than anything. I mean, yes, she was a drug addict and she hung out with these biker guys, but she was really just like a low income working class person. And you're right. That's, I've never even thought of that, but he, that is a foreign, that's a, another planet for yeah. Peter B. Yeah. You know? It's like, uh, yeah, Good the point. bikers, the bikers have hearts of gold. You know, that one biker doesn't speak and he literally like uh like uh disney animal or something or like dopey or something like he's just kind of like that's what i just said yeah like yeah yeah looking at he's, the puppies it's like he's literally just like wordless disney kind of character or whatever uh yeah. dopey what? but i think like but then there's um the 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 prostitute she's like the hooker with the heart of gold too right and yep. like um and then even the people like that are there's people that are mean to him, but um, I don't know. There's just not there's not any tension really in this movie. I there's guess no it's just tension. him versus right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> point. Well, we said earlier to, our, to each other like there's a formula here, and it's ridiculous because it's it's literally this only and ever when someone insults him, you know they, they see him, you know the image of him is his head, and there's an insult or a misunderstanding, and it just happens literally once. And then he has a witty remark and he wins over the audience. He's like, what's the matter? You never seen a guy from Neptune? And everybody goes, like, oh, we fucking love this guy who like was shocking us with his appearance like eight seconds ago. And it's just, that's the only, that's, the, and it's, yeah. it, it rings very untrue. That, yeah, that's true. I, well, just uh, the, not to stop pausing that for one second, because like there's that thing in movies too, like where people are just too mean, like for real life. And like, I know people are mean in high school or whatever, like, you know, uh, but I've never seen anyone act, behave that way. There's like it happens in movies, a trope where people are just beyond belief mean to like someone oh. who is like you has go to, a disability or you didn't like, go to high school and you didn't go to high know. school in suburban Minnesota. So I mean, I, I mean, it's pretty. Ooh, we'll see, oh, really? Well, they, uh, well, the, oh, in yeah. suburban Minnesota, they would have been like, "Hey, Rocky, like take off yeah. that mask." They totally. would have said that kind of thing to him. Oh my! Like, they would have been like, "Oh, take friend, off the mask." Hold on, my friend <laughs> who I went to high school with when he was younger, kids used to bully him by calling him mask. Okay, and we grew up in Minnesota. So why? Zing. What, like, did, did well, he have like, a? 
he just had like a, a disability. No, no, no. It's just like he, this, the kids are being mean, you know. Like no, so I got dude, it. So they reference this. Film. Saying, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Wait, well, I don't know, Marcus. You might uh, you might be wrong. Well, I just didn't think like I just did thought most people had more respect than the than the. It's so tasteless, you know. And these, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it happens, but uh, kids, it teenagers suck, really though. Come yeah, on, teenagers yeah. suck. We well, I know they'd say it. something behind their back, but I wouldn't. It's hard for me to be, ever accept in a movie that people would say that kind of thing to your face. Like, also, hey, late kid, 90s. how's late what's 90s. with the dead mom, kid? You know, I always see that stuff in movies, and I'm like, wow, that's just like. Uh, beyond belief for me, but no, whatever. It's I'm a minor sure. complaint. I, yeah. I, I totally get what you're saying. I, you know, late '90s is a different story for me when I was in school. But let me just say one thing about the bikers, <laughs> real quick. <clears throat> is um, you know, th- this is something that's a little curious to me about Peter B. Um, is you know, in in the films in, in his past, like Last Picture Show or something, like you know, he is, uh, which I'm very suspect of. Maybe we'll get into that later. But looking at a movie like Last Picture yeah. Show. When you're noticing that that movie is about, um, you know, more normalish people, and it's shown with that kind of care or like interest in like a different society that he's not a part of, but for here right. he has like no interest to even portray these characters yeah. to go and, another and layer down to go a layer, just one layer down. Yeah, you know? I know, I know. And that's very suspect oh. for a. F- Suppose I think it was right. film. Look, makeup. like we said, he's a hired gun here. Look, look, okay, you, you framed it. Um, he had a string of bombs, and we know why. We can maybe get into that. But he had a string of bombs from the um, mid 70s on, and then I think it got really arid, and he had literally like nothing, not even bombs. And so he really needed some, uh, he needed something on his resume. And so uh, he got hired for Mask. It's probably a somewhat cheap film, you know, and he's probably cheap. It and he feels was cheap, ki- yeah. He was kind of, what I'm saying is that he was kind of a name, but certainly not anywhere near like an A-list, like not even like Bob Rifelson or something. So um, this was a gig. That's what I'm, what I'm saying. So I don't think much of his heart is in it. I think he was just trying to make the best film possible and do these kind of corny things like, you know, this kind of crane shot. Like John Ford told me that this is a great way to like, <laughs> like bring in the audience, you know, like this, that kind of stuff. It's well, like, it was just an, it was an exercise for him. It, it is weird how little depth it has. And like, it would, I never really think about this movie in terms of elephant man. I'm always like, Oh yeah, I guess those are. So I, it, it almost feels more like a short circuit or something. Like it has the same emotional Absolutely. depth as that. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> Which yeah. is very weird. I know. Very weird. Do we want to talk about a little bit of the Peter B. history and, and with, get into the flaws? Um, I, I, can we circle back maybe? Like, um, yeah. I kind of – what I was interested in doing, if it, it, I'll just articulate, is, is follow through on the, um, the saccharine confection and show okay. a few more examples. Sure. Just to really uh, put our, our point across here, the, our case you know, against this film. Okay. Um, we, really quick, we could do um, one of the corniest things you can do in a film – and something that any talented director who's sophisticated would immediately put the kibosh and say, I am not shooting a scene like this. And I call it a, uh, you can do it scene, you know, out of like the water boy. It's like the, it's the kind of scene that in the late nineties, water boy is parodying and it's the graduation moment. Uh, Mr. Evan. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, yeah. For achievement in history, Rocky Dennis. <laughs> Everybody's there. And for academic excellence in science, Rocky Dennis. <laughs> What's the biker gang doing this, by the way? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's any, any director worth his weight uh, or her weight. Um, would just go. I'm not. I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, like, or, yeah. or I'm going to do it really differently. But he just went for the gold, and that is a scene that is. It, it was corny then in 1985. Yeah, it's like and a it's, dream fantasy or something well, like like everyone important from your life is there cheering you on, like your your, your accomplishments and yeah. yeah like the biker game should be like moshing and smoking cigarettes and causing like a disturbance. Well, yeah, or should have. You, you know, know what? You know what would have been good. Well, I'm going to help uh, Peter B here make a better mask. All right. <laughs> I think just one example, just a little little edge to the scene, for instance, that we just saw, the graduation. It should have a, an uptight lady in front of all the bikers who are loudly cheering. She should turn around with a nasty look on her face and say, um, could you please? And then one of the bikers just like tips his ash 
onto her hair, you know, or something like that. So it's like, lady, hey, lady, lighten the frick up, you know, it's Rocky Dennis. Like something, because because there's no, well, first of all, you could, you wouldn't know they were bikers, like, you know, in their yeah. behavior once. Just give them, and it would, it would goose the film a little bit. It would give yeah, it a little Yeah, like you don't see any of how the world's going to react to them at all. You don't get any of that, right, like, exactly. reaction shot out. You don't know how to feel about these bikers. It's a room yeah. full of yelling bikers. <laughs> Uh, for this severely disabled child, it's like this is kind of weird. Let's kind of like live in this social <laughs> dynamic for a second. You know what I mean? You no, know, it just plays. It just plays. You know? Can we fucking please nothing. remake Mask? Please, can the three of us reboot? <laughs> oh, I thought we were. I thought that's where this is going. Yeah. I have some thoughts. Well, quick side note is my favorite thought experiment uh, in the past twenty four hours thinking about the movie is: What if Werner Herzog made a, uh, a documentary <laughs> on Rocky? It mm. is. It's not unbelievable that it would happen you know he made god's angry man mm -hmm. about the you know the los angeles um preacher ripoff man in the late 70s he like i could see him doing like a german public television special about um about rocky you know and, and he he would i mean he's he's covered um the subject of uh people children with disabilities you know since the early 70s you know so anyway i'm just saying that like i could when you think about the richness and the potential of really documenting real rocky dennis's life um, it does make Peter's film look really lame, you know, yeah. even more. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and I just wanted to put a button on this. You know, we were just, uh, you know, we just had referenced, uh, uh, the, the, the sugar pop of, um, the, the, the graduation scene. You can do it. Let's do one more. And it's actually a little bit infamous. Um, and it's cited, uh, you know, in certain circles. Um, let's play that scene and, and here's some, uh, a special individual, uh, give a little commentary on this scene. <laughs> um, of, uh, of one of the more famous scenes in Mask. Okay, here we go. This yeah. is red. Ah! <laughs> oh when God, it cools red? down, when it cools down, it'll be pink. Rocky, I understand. Okay, hold on a second. This is billowy. <sighs> wow. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read a quote uh, from filmmaker John Waters. Uh, okay. Uh, what if John Waters made Mask? Ooh. Sorry? What if John Waters made Mask? There you go. Well, I think we might get an idea uh, of that possibility um, of what the potential of that could be in a quote. Uh, the book Crackpot, which is fucking awesome. There's a chapter, which is fucking awesome, which is like 101 things I hate. And he numbers them. And uh, lots <laughs> of numbers, lots of numbers tick off for this film. And now I'm going to read this trigger warning. This is John Waters. Uh, and so it's a harsh depiction of, uh, of good old Rocky, who I think all three of us Aww. actually love the real Rocky. Rocky's the man. I love this guy. Oh, of course. But this is John Waters. Okay. So quote, John Waters starts now um, from his list of 101 things I hate. So in the middle, I'm quoting, I hide in the other side of the twin movie theater. But not for long. Mask is playing. It's Cher, who is okay in chastity, but under the direction of that whining Peter Bogdanovich, number 67. Uh, Mask was 66. Bogdanovich is 67. You know, the things he hates. Uh, Bogdanovich seems to be getting good reviews for not wearing Bob Mackie outfits, he says of Cher. Um, it's about a kid with a deformed face who is not only ugly, he's an asshole to boot. <laughs> His mother is supposed to be a biker, but her Hells Angels friends are about as threatening as the Seven Dwarves. Naturally, <laughs> this Elephant Man Jr. falls in love with a gorgeous oh. blind girl. And in one scene uh, where he tries to show her how beautiful the sky is, it uh, goes like this. But I can't see. I don't know blue, she protests. Never at a loss for a sickening solution. All ugly heats up rocks to different temperatures and puts them in her hand and says, this is blue. And she responds, I see it. I see it, the girl moans. And I went temporarily insane, <laughs> slashing six different movie seats with my car keys and bellowing out to startle viewers that Dorothy Stratton should feel lucky she was murdered. Anything was better than a life with Peter Bogdanovich. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So... Oh, hey, that's John Wait, Waters, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, explain to my seven-year-old brain why is that scene dumb? <laughs> the, uh, the, the blue because, and the pink. Well, no, no, he didn't say dumb. He said it's it's our whole thread here that we've been discussing, which is it's cloying. 
Yeah. You no. Know? Right. 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 It's, it's tacky. It's tacky. You know, it's interesting when when he says he's like, you and know, that's John Waters. Right. So. Of course. When it's John Perfect. Waters. Sentimental. When John Waters said that he's like uh, ugly, you know, I cringe a little bit. And it's interesting to We're me. Talking I was about thinking, the movie. I know was- the movie, right? Right, of course. And I was just thinking about like one thing that's weird about Rocky is that you know he was one of those. So the Elephant Man was like 1800s, right? So he's almost like a almost like a fictional character in our in our heads, you know. But mm-hmm. Rocky would have otherwise he would have been one of those kids that was like in mask watching the movie. You know what I mean? Like if yeah, had, sure. So it's it's kind of weird. Like there's that there's that element of it where he is that character was is like was a part of like our lives and our world. You know, like uh, at the same time that we were like, you know, there's something that makes it more sadder and more tragic because he's closer well, to us. Well, it's more contemporary, you know. Yeah. So exactly. here's here's my last thought on this. Uh, I just I made a few notes, and I think one thing um, for me, I'm speaking of myself, is. Uh, you know, there's, I have a lot of feelings about this film. There, there's, uh, there's some dynamic tension. And I've been saying that um, I think I find the, the cloying stuff, like these scenes we just watched, amusing because they're so campy. And right. then I also kind of like the warm bath of the, um, of, the, of the mechanics of making a pop film, you know, and like pressing all of our, manipulating all our buttons. But there's one other thing, and that it actually relates to the John Waters uh, quote we just read, which is very harsh. Um, and very dark humor. It's pitch black humor, right. and I, you know, and, and there, there are some uh, disc jockeys who've gone on rants about. Uh, and uh, Jim Norton, the comedian, has done some really crazy, severe um, uh, observations of, of masks that are very unkind. And again, pitch, pitch, pitch black comedy. But my takeaway from the psychoanalyzing it, and 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 includes my feeling on it, just to end this whole thing, is I find it's almost oppressive emotional manipulation. And um, if you have any feeling about it, other than what mask is forcing you to feel, um, you're not allowed to express that because it's you know it's about a, a disabled person, um, and it and it's suffocating in its earnestness, mm-hmm. and it creates a nervous tension, which causes some to really react with gallows humor, like John Waters, because it's it's what you're not it's the taboo it's like. Like you are absolutely not to have any other opinion or express anything else other than he is a hero. What a great boy. What a, you know, like what a, what a courageous person and what, and all these great people. And it's just like, can I say something else? And it's like, no, you can't. And humor is always generated. You know, it's like nuclear fission. It's like generated from tension. And it's just like, ah, fuck Rocky Dennis, his big head, fuck him. You know, and so it's like, um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a symptom of having a film being so uh, oppressive in its emotional manipulation. So you're yeah, going to totally. get that kind of, you know, yeah, and that's, and, and, and that, and that's a feeling that we've sort of discussed on the channel before with Magnolia too. It's like this, ah. uh, this like oppression, you know, this, this yes. like emotional oppression that, that, that I think is, you know, there is kind of like a, um, I don't know, like at least for me, there's like a, a a real repulsion to that, you know. It's like ah, I, you know, I hate that. I hate that feeling in movies where it's suffocating, you know. Yeah, it's almost like a cilantro and, and gene and then, or something, you know, for that. Yeah, and so and then, <laughs> and then and then another thing to kind of round this out. We were discussing this earlier amongst ourselves, but like, um, there's something. There's another tension in this film specifically because again, there are films where people have disabilities and you know they may be blind or in a wheelchair. Um, uh, you know, even maybe mildly, you know, uh, you know, mentally disabled, but like, um, just literally his affliction, which is the distortion of what a regular, you know, dumb old human being head is, is so, um, intense. And, you know, uh, they say that, um, our, our brains are hardwired to respond most with, with most depth more than anything else out there in nature and our DNA to the human face to recall it so closely and to have it vividly we drink it in and it goes right into like the the marrow of our consciousness the human right. face so, so the fact that what i mean is that uh, you know rocky's face is unconventional to say the least so it's what to me is like not funny but just there's an odd tension in a film that is so like rainbows and, and ponies but like in the center of it uh, of the topic uh, the main point of the film, and and of course throughout the film, you see this person with an incredibly different—I'll just say it that way—human face, and I find that there's a, a chafing and a friction and tension in that, which is not intentional, and I don't think it's like successful, but mm-hmm. it makes it that also makes mass kind of strange to me. Like it's not like he's in a wheelchair 
where he has a body that uh, with conventionality that our you know our our, our, our minds you know on a sub level yeah. like just you know like scan it and go like well that's just a person who's sitting down but this is a, a an almost violently intensely different looking human face and i think that that's it's odd for them to try to pull it off where it's just more or less a movie where it's like oh the kid's you know blind or he I, broke his neck you yeah. know i think it, you're getting close to all. one of the things that's actually good about the film is that like even though it's got this mask you know it's this this makeup and this sort of like grotesque face that like eric stoltz is like very charismatic in it you know and he's like he is like super likable he's so nice you know he's I think you, I don't even feel so like emotional for him as much as just like he's a nice regular kid. And I think, uh, I feel like he he's coming through as like a regular kid, even though he has the mask. I think that's pretty, um, his, and the fact that you don't see much of his face, but he's able to communicate that. I think that's actually, I'm not saying I love this movie or anything, but I'm saying that I think that is one of the good things about it is that like he gives a pretty yeah. decent charismatic like performance, you know? Like first, I agree with you. I think, um, I was I actually wanted me to pivot to like the pluses and I, I really would like to actually because I think there are and 99% of it is Eric Stoll's performance it's fantastic but I still I guess I would disagree with you in that like um, part of the how can I put this the normalization of a severe affliction to the human form um, even in uh, his performance I think it's kind of uh, bogus and a little rainbows and ponies because the way he carries himself and walks around is just like like he's like he's very agile and there's even a scene we have here where he's playing around at the hospital like he's fucking patch adams and i think that um <laughs> it, it actually that's part of the friction i mean because it starts actually feeling like this is just a teenage guy in a teenage movie and it's just like oh he and it feels like he is wearing a mask the character well yeah like he really has, make a, like, like, make a, this way. rocky dennis was legally blind you know and they just dropped that like, well you know, yeah, I, I read that too, but his mom said that he was legally, that's the whole thing with Rocky, right? Is that the doctor said he was legally blind, but he could read anyway, and that he was good in school. Like, they said he would be legally blind because his eyes were so far apart or whatever, but he like, still was able to learn how to read and like, you know, and did good in school. So I guess like, that is part of the whole thing is that um, he was able, you know, his mom like, uh, was able to push him to, you know, do to be a normal person and a normal kid. You know, I don't know. I think that part of it is, uh, I don't, yeah, anyway. <laughs> it, it is. Well, I think it's interesting that it's like, you know, that, that, that she is this biker mom and, and, and like gives him that sort of attitude. Like you probably had to have had a biker mom in order to, uh, have had, that's true. You know, that sort of his socialization, like his, he had yeah. a, a bonus in his socialization yeah. because they're just tough people, you know, like they live tough and they're, yeah. they're straight shooters and stuff. So actually, to speak to that, because I did want to start talking about the merits of the film, and I'm glad you brought up, Marcus, um, Stoll's great performance, because that, that was my main takeaway, is like, the film is this kind of extra corny film made by a hack could have been really unwatchable, but it's really Eric Stoll's who does seal the deal. Well, and I, um, and I, I have two different thoughts, right. and, and we've, we've litigated that, who cares? But I'm just <laughs> saying that like it is his performance that it does shine. So I was just going to say, guys, maybe we show an example. Sure. Um, if you don't mind, it's the headaches, which is a great scene. For, forget everything I've said and we've said. I think that's just a nice scene in a movie. It's very memorable. Like, it's this Eric. is one of the things I do really remember. Yeah, about it's it, really yeah. great. It's really great. And we can only play a little snippet because the uh, YouTube overlords. It's cloudy. In the ocean is dark. Smells good. Uh, it does Spain in the morning. Mm -hmm. I checked the bikes. Tell me about the bikes. I should have set that up. Uh, it would help a little bit of context, but maybe you've seen Mask. But uh, he, he unfortunately has these really severe migraines that probably made it impossible to sleep. And he and his mom had this, this great routine and he would just, she would let him just articulate his wishes and fantasies. Like we're going to go to, you know, Mallorca and, you know, we're going to go to yeah. Ibiza and like, you know, and, and just, and, and that helped him wind down from the severe head pain 
And that's a little moment. There's a longer scene, and it's uh, all fantastic. But yeah, I'm gonna that's go out a limb and say, like, even like even though it doesn't have much, she doesn't have much depth as like a drug addict or biker, or you don't feel that pain so much. I think Cher's good in this for like a young that. adult movie. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That. No, I, I'm I'm gonna go on a further limb, and I think I think Cher is good across the board. I think I think she's a good actor. Yeah. I mean, shit, man, yeah. she's fucking amazing in Silkwood. Like for real, yeah. <laughs> like she's Absolutely. really good in that movie. And yeah. and can I can I can I get a little uh, segue from Cher being good in this movie to a little knock on Peter B. If I if I can, um, um, this seems to be <laughs> your uh, your spirit animal. Uh, oh so yeah, I, hunting been, down I, Peter. Uh-huh. I, I, honestly, the Peter B. Show. <laughs> uh, oh, dude, honestly, every, tune in next week. <laughs> no, so, yeah, what's next week? No, seriously. From Star 80 to researching Star 80 to researching for this week, everything I've read or heard about Peter B. in the last two weeks makes me just like think what a total pompous dickwad he was. And I know <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of heat from the scarf Can wearers, you? from the scarf wearers and the cardigan film crowd out there. But dude, there's some <laughs> shit I've been reading, and here's one of them. Um, so supposedly, this movie, uh, Mask, was one of the reasons Cher stopped acting for a long time because of the Whoa. onset strife she had with Peter B. on set. Uh, apparently, Peter B. Uh, at the Cannes Film Festival in '85, he publicly at a press conference, he just fucking decided to throw her under the bus for no reason to say that. Um, well, she just ignored my direction all the times, and she doesn't know how to act. Ooh. You know, I had to. I. I, I I couldn't have my John Ford long takes with fucking mask because I had to oh, cut around her performance. Shit. And uh, he said, quote, uh, Cher can't act and she doesn't like men. That's one quote. And also, no. we can only... You know why? Did it, yeah. she, no, because she doesn't like Christ. Peter Bogdanovich. Yeah, right. She didn't that's respond that's, to him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Kind of mac on her. Of that's she didn't respond to my advances. Right. Yeah, not not that <laughs> she's been like one of the world's like most beautiful women for the past 20 years and she yeah, doesn't want to get in bed with me. Uh, of course. <laughs> oh, my and, God. Quote, here we go. And he also said, quote, we can only thank him for her performance. So... Oh um, God! Really? Was, you know, he was yes. <clears throat> he wasn't over it after God. at Cannes either. He was like on the. Uh, I didn't watch much of the DVD commentary. Tom, maybe you could speak to this, but he every he did, word <laughs> he did trash. He said the same thing on the commentary. He was saying like that there was like she would want to do it one way, and he would say yeah. no, do it the other way, and like, a little more fight, diplomatic. And, but, yeah. yeah. Well, can I <laughs> can I can I sort of now get get into the Peter B. flops now that I'm starting to come out with some haymakers like uh, okay, but but promise me, <laughs> I, I want to do a little more lauding of the film, and so maybe we'll end on a on a high note. Okay, and we got to talk about good. the music too. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay. I'm, please, I'm, gonna, go ahead. I, I'm gonna get this in real quick because you know we don't have much time, but basically I, I want to shout out this because right now uh, right now you can listen to. Uh, the wonderful podcast, You Must Remember This, did a series recently called Polly Platt, The Invisible Woman, uh, which is uh, a episodic podcast. I listened to the first two episodes, but, you know, Raymond. That's uh, Kare- Karina Longworth. Yep, so, um, right. You know, she's great. Yeah. Yeah. She did an amazing, amazing work with this series. I highly encourage you guys to listen to it. I, 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 I listened to the first two, but Ramey, you know, who was our guest last week, she binged the whole fucking thing. Um, and the only reason I bring this up is because I think it's a con- it provides context as to why how Peter B. got to mask, you know, and I, I won't spoil the podcast too much, but I, I think what it really does is, you know, Polly Platt was Peter B.'s first wife and collaborator. They actually collaborated very closely on his main films that he's known for. Last Picture Show, um, uh, Help Me Out Here, Targets, and of course... Um, uh, Paper Moon. Well, Paper Moon, thank you. Yeah, and What's and, Up Doc, um, yeah. Right. And uh, but anyway, so it, th- this podcast kind of details th- how their mutual love of cinema uh, when they were younger, how, how they came together and, you know, they, they got married and they just loved films and the old Hollywood directors. But it really shapes and it really discusses about how much she was this incredible collaborator in his life that does not yeah. get any credit for the work that she contributed. I, I never use this term, but but she was he really erased her erased completely. Her, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it's sickening to hear on this podcast about how in this th- this relationship was blossomed all to make Peter be this big Hollywood director. You know, she had her own ambitions, but it really was all like like they like they'd be lying in bed, and Peter would be worrying about like if his last name was too long to fit on the marquee and stuff no. like that. You know, yeah. And she'd be like, <laughs> no, be no, like, no, 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 no. He'd yeah. walk around with good reviews in his pocket when he'd go to lunch and yeah. bring them out during lunch and quote them. 
Yeah, you know? oh, of course. Oh, um, uh, well, you know what it is? He's 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 he was an auteur wannabe guy. So oh, well, of he course. Thought he so, thought he was Dorsten Wells or something, right? Well, yeah. well, he he just yeah, and and so you know he's like, Mom, my, my name's not going to fit on the marquee. So don't worry, dear. You know, there's Joseph von Sternberg. You'll be okay. And so um, anyway, uh, the most egregious thing is about Last Picture Show because and th- and that's a, a real example of this where. You know, it, it was Polly's idea to adapt the book. Uh, she read it. She fought for it to get made. She had the vision for the movie. She had even convinced Peter Jeez. B. to make this movie because he didn't get it. Jesus. You know, and yeah. it was her sort of vision to be like, oh, I want to make this frank and nuanced movie about sexuality from a female perspective. And she really identified with that. That was all her. And um, she wanted to shoot it in black and white. That was her idea. And when the movie was, fu- uh, this is what she did on the film, just so I can, uh, and I'll, I'll be quick. She came up with yeah, the yeah. shot list. She came up with a shot list every day. She devised the camera positions every single day. She was the location manager. She was the production designer. She designed the costumes. She sourced the costumes. And she did all all of the hair and makeup, not to mention the hair and makeup every day of Sybil Shepard, who Peter B. was cheating on <laughs> Polly with openly. Well, there's that, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, he, and he ultimately left He ultimately left Polly for, for uh, Sybil, yeah. Right. And devastatingly Which you enough, can learn about in civil disobedience. Yeah, right. <laughs> but devastatingly enough, she Polly only gets a production designer credit on the movie, and she should have gotten at least a fucking producer credit, if not even Unbelievable. a fucking associate producer credit. But she really Unbelievable. She's, a co- she's really a co director of that movie. And anyone yeah. who's on set or newer could would back that up a million percent. She also produced targets from the ground up. All right, whatever. I'm done. But anyway. So they, what you're saying is Polly Platt wasn't on mask? Right. Well, exactly. So they stopped working together on Paper Moon, and you know she went on to do amazing shit. Broadcast News, B- Bottle Rocket, she p- produced. She discovered Matt Groening was a big part of that. Yeah, anyway, I've always heard that she had a great eye for talent. A hundred percent. And plucked people. Um, so, and uh, The Simpsons was kind of like her idea of, of getting you know gro- you know Groening with these other people collabing. And yeah, so, she's she's so- obviously a talented person. Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll be real quick because I see that clock. Okay, so okay. all right, so Paper Moon, after Paper Moon, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and this is where their collaboration ends. Mr. Peter B. has got some fucking flops in a row. Okay, he's got Daisy Miller. He's got... Ugh. <laughs> at Long Last at, at Love. Long Last Love, right. which is an unwatchable legend, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a movie called Nickelodeon from 1975, oh. which... Uh, which, when it opened, this is so funny. When it opened, it was so soundly blasted that Peter B. wrote an open letter in the Hollywood Reporter apologizing for the bad movie. It lost oh, millions shit. and soured him against all the major studios because they labeled him a megalomaniac. Then uh, he makes They All Laughed, which we talked about last week with Dorothy Stratton, but he blamed the perfor- <laughs> poor performance of that film on Dorothy's death, feeling people didn't want to be watching a movie with a murder victim in it and that it overshadowed and Time uh, steps. Yeah, time the, steps. <laughs> the jury's out on that one. But um, <laughs> now we get mask. Okay, so four flops in a row. Um, what do you do, guys? You need to safeguard yourself uh, with something flop proof, with something critic proof, something that tugs on them heartstrings, man. Sentimental. Exactly. Let's make. It's a what we've been movie. saying the whole time. Yeah. Right. Let's make a brave film. Like, that ex- like if you if you hate my film, you're a bad person. Exactly. <laughs> So, right. exactly. yeah. It's critic proof, right? Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. Really. We're having some trouble here. Yeah. We're almost having a little trouble here. You know, I, we're, we're tiptoeing a little here. I can't believe how nice you guys have been. Let's make a brave film that exploits a cranial condition. Woo! All right, and then you know, and and so he finally makes Mask as a work for hire because he was so financially down and out. Um, and ironically, it became his most critically uh, successful film. <laughs> so it's just interesting that, you know, when the, you know, genius woman leaves, um, things are oh, looking a little it's different. It's so obvious. It's so clear. It's it's yeah. like it's almost yeah. like a band and like uh I'm just making it up. I can't think of an exact a real example, but it's like like there's a band and one guy leaves and then suddenly all the songs suck. Yeah. You know, like but the other but the lead singer is credit is the songwriter and it's like well, you know, it's just that kind. Of, it's just like on bold faced, like clear evidence. You know, like yeah. you don't, you don't, you didn't even need to get into a. Sh- there's not even an argument. It's just so, factual. You know, exactly. Like there's and, a cut. There's a, there's like the divorce and then Daisy Miller. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I dare yeah. you to watch Daisy Miller. Oh no! Next week. Dare no. you? All right. So, uh, so then. <laughs> Part three. Here's, here's like the uh, Peter B. Month. Yeah. <laughs> here's the reputation he has in town. I got to read these two guys because. 
uh, just please let me. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Irvin Winkler. <laughs> Irvin Winkler, the this is his Peter B's reputation. Irvin Winkler, producer of Goodfellas and Rocky, described Peter B in his prime as, quote, the eas- easily the most arrogant person he's ever met in the film business. Okay, imagine all the territory that takes in. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and part of the quote, uh, and he still to this day, which obviously Peter's passed on, but still to this day, he, would be- he begins sentences with, as John Ford famously said to me, dot, dot, dot. Um, oh. Okay, last one. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget don't forget Hawks, Howard Hawks. Yeah. Billy yeah. Wilder once famously said about Peter Bogdanovich. Oh this is this is money, money, money. All right. Uh he said, quote, It isn't uh it isn't true that Hollywood is a bitter place divided by hatred, greed, and jealousy. All it takes to bring everyone together is another flop by Peter Bogdanovich. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Oh, uh, shit. Wow. Um, well, and sounds Tom, like Peter, Peter B. had to sort something out. If you hate my movie, you're a bad person. That's Peter what the B. poster should have said. Oh, there's more? Just, Are we good? I'm Go. just going to say we're good. Peter B. turned down, you know, he turned down The Godfather. He turned down The Exorcist. He turned down Chinatown. And instead, he made your Daisy Miller. Um, so that's what he Daisy did. Daisy Miller, yo. But somehow so, he kept swimming along making movies. You know, I guess just like yeah. once the machine's going, it's, it's going to Well, get, there was a long you know. break between They All Laughed and Mass because he had like a full yeah. breakdown after Dorothy was murdered. And yeah, he didn't have much of a second. Uh, he needed work. Sorry, the yeah. first half of the 80s. Yeah. yeah. So um, right, we were done. running out of time. So I'm just, I want to thank you. And that was, it was great. It was fascinating. And. And it does kind of bookend us with uh, last week's episode, which is, is really interesting. And I, I love that the the poor man recently just died, and uh, somewhat coincidentally, um, <laughs> like this is not intentional, but we're like you know uh, throwing spitballs at the poor guy. We're definitely, get, and I've get met him, him and everything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've like had pleasant conversations with him. It's weird. Uh, I, I don't even. I don't. I'm just. You know what? These are the facts. These are the facts. That's all I was going to say. They're facts. Like Daisy Miller is the. F- uh, is the facts okay <laughs> okay so um just a few things as we're wrapping up here um i was kind of starting to um uh, talk about some appreciation i have for the film and i think what i'll say uh, maybe and I, maybe maybe all agree at least i think marcus does um right off the bat there's a great actress who pretty much premieres with a, a, a large role oh yeah you know i think she's 18 years old laura fucking dern man laura dern is in mask and she elevates the film she does a great job, sure. uh, and um, um, she, uh, you know, she's a blind girl who, you know, bond, uh, has a romance with uh, with Rocky, and like, uh, you know, she she had, she had done her homework. She worked with blind folks and, and tried to really take the role seriously, you know, and, and actually uh, uh, suppress her sight somehow and to try to live blind and stuff like that. She took the role very seriously. And she does a great job, and also I, I just today I was re- rewatching some of it and I was like, it's actually a pretty damn good love story albeit brief and it is out of like a fairy tale book it's, you know even like you know the blind girl and the, and the shrek guy you know like it almost feels like a fairy tale literally but um and by the way it never happened this is totally made up rocky dennis did not have a blind girl relationship or anything what? but um sorry but but oh. i will say this if we could just if we could roll that beautiful bean footage the brief scene where um and i'll set this one up sorry is um they're at the beach, it's a very nice location, and they've bonded and they're getting romantic feelings for each other uh, because he's a counselor at a, a blind person's camp, blind kids camp, and they like each other a lot, but she doesn't know what he looks like. He hasn't said anything and she can't see him, obviously. And so he's very timid, but I think she wanted to find out through touch, you know, what this guy she's really digging, you know, looks like, his face. And so it's, it's, it's um, there's a, a lot of emotions going on and they both do a killer job. In, right. in a very, in a very sensitive right, play the clip. Yeah, we got to talk about the music. Time. <laughs> Set it up, Marcus. <laughs> I know. You think? <laughs> so, and Blue Velvet is next year for her, right? Mm, yes. Pretty good to me. There you go, man. She's kill- yeah, she's killing it. I yeah, mean, like, it's to have so her- good to have her come in at the last like 
you know, a third of the, you know, the last third of the movie and like give a really strong performance like that. She's, she really outshines the prostitute actress, you know, like she's like, Laura Dern just comes in and she's like, yes, I'm a movie star and you're going to be watching me in tons of movies after this. I know, you know, like, yeah, she's a powerhouse and that's a very, that's a tough scene for an actor for both of them, I'm sure. And especially with, with, uh, you know, Stoles with all the makeup, but uh, he does it. And, you know, like I was saying before, like the human beings are, hardwired to really respond to faces, but especially eyes. And he does have, you know, Eric Stoll's eyes, you know, in, in this makeup. And he just he uses it, you know, he uses it as much as he can and and, and all that he can. Um, so uh, I, I just I, I want to just maybe give a shout out and kind of tune out on my side of town here on a, a really great moment in, a, in an otherwise pretty mediocre film that I hope we've analyzed enough to uh, get under the hood about what its maladies are. So um, What's the one thing that you there's one, when we were watching this movie again? You were lamenting that there's a version of it that just does not exist anymore. Yes, I know the version of Mask with the <laughs> cat man do uh, simply explained, and that by the way is your cold open, uh, 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 Evan. Um, but cook cat man do that's um, one of the many bad, fucking lame Bob Seger. Like, you know, like, uh, oh, rock and roll, Stewie, yeah. so, because what happened is, like, uh, the intention, exactly, the intention was originally to have Bruce Springsteen songs because uh, uh, real Rocky loved uh, Springsteen and the Beatles, by the way, awesome. and so, um, uh, yeah, Bogdanovich wanted to have uh, Springsteen, and lots of legal bullshit with, like, his camp, legal stuff, paperwork, and they couldn't do it, so they quickly just grabbed Seeger. That's the one I know because the Seeger one is the original <laughs> they version. They want my music and, and what? The- <laughs> yeah right i know and it's the tbs like the tbs version that i've seen like 800 times i've only known the bob seger with that awful cat man do song so when i see this other one now it's hard it's hard to find the bob seger cat man do one and now it's all springsteen it doesn't the, the 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 junk pop trash vibe is reduced by not having the bob seger Right, because Springsteen has some emotional weight to it. Yeah, it's like it's kind that, of that's not communicated yeah. by the Seeker. Is I'm it more than it. one Seeker song in it? Like, or is it just well, Katmandu? Of- no, no, no. <laughs> uh, is a lot of Katmandu. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like one other song. Well, let's all do. Let's all do Katmandu here on, on the way out. Two, three. Katmandu. Uh, we all have time delays. Shout out to. Shout out to Dick Hyman on the soundtrack too, and they're in the the uh... yeah the Min- the Minotaur is yeah. no, that's not it. No, 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 no. It's oh, I fucking forgot. But it's a song from his big album. The it's the Mo- they, uh, Moog album. The yeah. Moog album when they um when uh, Rocky sees himself in the funhouse mirror. Ah, we didn't show that clip. That's a really good clip. We didn't show a lot of the clips. And that's you know what? Clip. That's a great. We moment, thought yeah. we would barely cover an hour, but we need a little more. But we don't. I was have just it, so. gonna say. <laughs> Damn. All right, everybody. That was one fucking hour on mask. Holy shit. I can't believe you said that. Um, Did you people out there do a mask podcast for an hour? I don't think you did. (laughs) But I was just going to say that it's remarkable that I was going into the show tonight being like, do that shit. I was just like going into the show tonight being like, man, I hope we make it. I don't know if we're going to make it, but then I'm staring at like all these notes of shit I didn't even fucking Me too. I have tons that. of notes. Like, right. Yeah. Evan, and Evan, Evan's like, uh, uh, and we're, we can't get us to shut up. I know. I'm, 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 I, I know. I know. Unreal. The most, you guys can't, I can't get in words edgewise because you guys are fucking rapping on masks. Is, is, right. is there, is there something, is there a lesson to be learned that it's almost like a, like a, like a Zen proverb, like, uh, investigate any film and you will find richness if you really look. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, is there something like that going on? Because I think most people just don't brush by mask. Even if they like it, they're like, yeah, mask, whatever. But like, I'd like to see a challenge, you know, like, yeah, exactly. Maybe people exactly. suggest uh, movies that there's no way we could spend an hour talking exactly. about. Exactly. Oh, we're going to yeah. get a lot of see, Garbo it's... suggestions on that one. But like, yeah. I think Greta Greta Garbo. Garbo's, <laughs> like, really, yeah. <laughs> But I, I say, I, you know, I, I, I think I, about I, it, I relish the challenge. I relish the challenge. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, mask. Uh, I can't believe we're here. We did it. I can't believe we actually audible. We did it hard, we, dude. We did it. We did it hard. We changed our calendar. We changed our plan. Right. You I know, know. I know. we had to reschedule anyway. And I, I, I know, but I also like that we had um, like kind of a like a, a part one and part two. Yes. On uh, that there's a Peter Bogdanovich thread, you know, from last week's Star 80, you know. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I thought right. that was cool, you know, yeah, because there, there were, and, and there was some connective tissue, and I appreciate you and Remy's research because mm-hmm. I wouldn't have thought there was as much as there was, and even, even, sorry, like John Waters brought it up. Uh, yeah, and his I, have rant. To, I have to shout out Remy too for for help, her help in this episode as well. Uh, yeah. She definitely armed me with you know uh, tons of research. I actually feel like a little Peter B. Polly action going on right now. Uh, right. Just because yeah, keep her in the she, background, like yeah. mirrors your real, yeah. your actual life. No, <laughs> yeah, like, like, let's, uh, yeah. let's, uh, thanks, girly. <laughs> but like, no, actually, what is her take on mask? Like, is it camp, of camp interest to her? Or she hates I think it she or? just. I think she really does not like mask. We should ne- next time we have her on when the clock stopped. You know, Ramy, what you think of mask? I, I I think she's pretty thumbs down on mask, but you know her and I, I just want to say just also for the record like we've been immersing ourselves in this peter b uh research right. and so i think we we definitely have the hates on you know because we've been we i been, get it we've been in it so maybe we're a little in it i know like you said recently departed but man there's some factoids here um so i got you well you know what i'll just say this i, I don't want to be the on record as the guy who's like thumbs up on mask i'm gonna coin kind of something are. here i'm gonna kind of are, though. i'm not though i'm gonna coin a gesture on the show, and this is my gesture. Okay, very mid. Th- thumbs, thumbs middle. Right. I right. vote middle. I vote <laughs> middle. Yeah. So, um, because and and I think uh, I'm not talking about the film. I know we're over an hour, but I'm just saying, like, I did find it just interesting, sort of, um, um, uh, academically speaking, that we could find such richness in a film that you know is pretty. It's Kind of just Hollywood shite, you know. Yeah. Trashy. Well, just a Trashy. reminder: that's the whole the 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 theme for this podcast is to analyze what makes true. a movie work or not work. So that's true, true, yeah, true, true. So hey, yeah. I was surprised. I, I I wasn't I wasn't sure where you guys were going to stand on this movie going into the show, and so I was surprised. Um, so I you know, and I and, and I kind of saw it in a different way too. When you guys talked about the YA sort of framework, I, I definitely yeah, I definitely the context that helps makes me think of it in a different way. But anyway, well, you know what got me. Was the love story? That's what made me realize because it does succeed. I think. All right, no Is more it, talking about masks, guys. It's <laughs> we already did a fucking hour just, on it. Should we just roll it back? Should we just do another fucking hour on motherfucking <laughs> goddamn orange peel beef? Okay. So, oh, the bikers. Yeah. All right. Uh, wait, Tom's leaving now. Okay. Um, let's, <laughs> let's let's let, let's let's talk. Okay. Let's. T- Let's talk about uh, next week. He's putting uh, on his mask. Oh, he's I can't get enough of mask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so into uh, mask. I'm wearing a mask. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. Like apples? Did, anybody, did did they ever make uh, mask uh, branded face masks? Okay. Uh, anyway, it was uh, the action like, figure. Oh yeah, that should have been like a popular like Halloween mask in '85. All right. Oh, well, all there right. was the action figure though. There was there? No. <laughs> was there no okay all right all right end of discussion let's talk about next week we are we are absolutely doing it 100 percent. it's confirmed right it is confirmed right yeah man let's do it okay next week we are finally the mask looking, we're looking at, <laughs> that would be ooh, no i'm, just kidding. I'm not we're doing do, that no we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> fuck that we are doing todd salons uh finally uh welcome to the dollhouse uh we have a special guest on next oh. week so uh, that's going to be great. That's going to be kind of great going. From, I mean, it's from from more kind of uh, similar well, art house. Well, I was going to say, you know, yeah. well, I think um, we're, we're, we're if you thought of this in sort of a lysergic sense, um, we're, there's right. this weird there's this weird kind of uh, <laughs> mutating like string theory going on here. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain. So it's like uh, Star 80, a very gritty, realistic account of a true life story. And then it morphs and it becomes a very artificial rendering of a true life story mm. of teenagers. Okay. <laughs> and then it's going to go, th- the string theory is going to thread out and become a gritty, funny, and true to life or true to, um, to, to the feeling life of what it's really like to be a high school, um, you know, in grade school kids and, you know, in, uh, in teens, which is welcome to the dollhouse. And then they're gonna smush them to turn them into dwarfs, man, because of the gravity. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then Star is gonna, gonna meet, uh, <laughs> like, uh, welcome to the dollhouse, yeah, you know, man. and go in a circle. No, I'm sorry, I'm getting long winded, but yeah, no, it's it's a great. Um, it feels just as this felt artificial and untrue. This yeah. is a really perfect 
movie about what it's really like to be on the front lines of being a fucking kid in like middle yeah. school here. Apologies you know? to everybody who watched it last week in anticipation of this week's episode, but enjoy mask this week. Yeah. No, welcome to a uh, break side. Welcome to all house. And it will be nice to watch uh, just about flawless film. Just a, yeah. just a monster. It's so good. hundred percent. I already have the uh, drum beat playing in my head. You know, yeah, mm, I know. <laughs> totally. You know what? I'm going to make fish sticks. Get it? Ooh, yeah. You know, that's for the podcast. Uh, fish all right, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking mask. Uh, we will see you. Uh, have a great rest of your week. A great weekend. And we'll see you next week for Welcome to Dollhouse. But first, it is time for your moment of Zen. All right, everybody. Bye take bye. care. We'll see you later. Bye bye. I mean, it's no secret in America that Peter and I didn't really get along. And I have my own, you know, philosophy and my own ideas about, about Peter Bogdanovich. And I don't think that they're necessarily important for you to know. But, uh, you know, it's not my job to really qualify Peter or the film or anything. My work is done and you can make your judgments on my work. You know, it's up there. I don't have to try and sell you. And also, I think from working with Peter, it's no surprise to me that Peter would serve his own interest before serving the film's interest. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. Mm -hmm.